Here's the first one. St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, you know, by the way, let me just say, I'm always happy to be among Dominicans. I love all the Dominicans here today. I'm a priest because of St. Thomas Aquinas, and I've always been uh, very much at home with Dominicans. In fact, a good friend of mine, Father Paul Murray, who's a great Dominican scholar in Rome, refers to me as an OP wannabe. <laughs> anyway, St. Thomas Aquinas was the first window we put in the new chapel. As I say, he's the reason I'm a priest. When I was a 14-year-old kid at Fenwick High School outside Chicago, we came in from recess one sweaty afternoon, and uh, the young friar introduced us to the quinque vie, the arguments for God's existence from Aquinas. And to this day, I'm still not entirely sure why it happened, but it was like a bell going off for me. It was convincing me of the reality of God in a way I never had been convinced before. And it's absolutely true to say I've never left the path I got on through the intervention of St. Thomas Aquinas when I was a kid of 14. So I want to uh, pay special tribute to him. Thomas obviously was with Augustine, the greatest intellectual in the history of the church. But being an intellectual in itself is not tantamount to holiness, is it? I mean, very smart people can be wicked. So what was Thomas's holiness? Well, you can see it in the lower panel of the window. Each of our windows, we have the saint and his heavenly manifestation, but then in the lower panel, there's a scene from the life of the saint. At the very end of his life, when Thomas was in Naples, he was finishing up the section on the Eucharist, which is in the third part of the Summa Theologiae. And it's a masterpiece, the questions on the Eucharist. But Thomas finished the text, and he just wasn't sure he had done justice to this great sacrament. And so he put the text at the foot of the cross, an icon of the cross. In fact, last summer I was filming, we're doing a new series on the ten pivotal players, one of whom is Aquinas. And I was privileged to get into that cell in Naples and to film right in there, and we saw the very icon before which Thomas placed the text. He put it there as though to ask for approbation. And according to the wonderful story, the voice comes from the cross. Bene scripsisti de me, Toma. Of course, Jesus spoke Latin to Thomas Aquinas. Well, have you written of me, Thomas? And then he said, what would you have as a reward? To which Thomas replied, you can see it in the window, non nisi te, domine. I will have nothing, Lord, except you. Now, I always tell my students, if and when you hear a voice <laughs> saying, what do you want, that's the right answer. <laughs> But now, I don't mean that flippantly at all, because this cuts very close to the heart of what it means to be a saint. We have all kinds of desires, right? In a few hours, we'll all be desiring a dinner. Tomorrow morning at the airport, I'll be desiring the plane goes back on time. Uh, we desire a, a suit of clothes or a car or whatever. We have all kinds of desires. But underneath and through all those small desires, there's a great desire. There's a hunger of the heart, which is a desire not for any particular thing, but the desire for joy, for peace, for meaning. To be a saint is, first of all, to awaken that desire. Now, mind you, there's the principal problem with our secularist society, a secularist ideology that says that question doesn't exist. It's only an illusion. It's not important. We got to fight that. We got to fight it in the schools. We got to fight it in the culture. We got to fight it in the streets if we have to. We have to fight for the legitimacy of that question. But then we have to hook it onto its proper object. As Augustine said long ago, long before Thomas, Lord, you've made us for yourself, and therefore our heart is restless until it rests in thee. The deepest longing of the heart can be satisfied only by God. What's the central tragedy of life when we hook that infinite desire for God onto something less than God? Thomas Aquinas, by the way, named the four principal mistakes that we make. We tend to hook that desire onto wealth, pleasure, 
power, or honor. Somehow those four things or some combination of them are going to fill up the longing of the heart. Of course they can't. When we try, what happens? We become frustrated, divided, deeply unhappy. I came across an article uh, not long ago in Rolling Stone magazine about Don Johnson. Remember Don Johnson from the 1980s, Miami Vice and all that, where he was probably the biggest TV star in the world. He was right now he's in his mid-60s somewhere, and he was reminiscing about those days. And he said, I remember one night there was a great party at my mansion, and my mansion included a kind of like its own a special bay in which several yachts were kept. And I was out in the balcony, he said, with a drink in my hand, looking out at this great scene of all the beautiful people partying on my three separate yachts. I had everything, wealth, pleasure, power, honor, influence. And he said, as he was standing there at the height of his powers, why am I so miserable? That's a great story. In some ways, it's the flip side of Aquinas's non nisi te domine. What do you want? What do you want? You know, when Jesus turns on the disciples that were sent by John the Baptist, and he says, what are you looking for? That's a great question. Every one of us should imagine the Lord Jesus turning on us and saying, what do you want? He's not asking about some little desire. He's asking about that most abiding desire of the heart. What do you want? What do you want? The only right answer, the answer of the saint is, I want nothing except you. Once that's clarified, look what happens, everybody. Then I know what to do with wealth, pleasure, power, and honor. If I don't have my central desire clarified, then Don Johnson, wealth, pleasure, power, and honor are going to turn on me. Once you know what you want, only you, Lord, then your life becomes like a beautiful rose window with one thing in the center and everything else revolving beautifully and harmoniously around it. Now, that's the saint's life. That's the well-integrated life. I'll give Kierkegaard the last word. He said a saint is someone whose life is about one thing. It's really good, isn't it? He doesn't mean his life is monotonous, uninteresting, anything but. His life's about one thing. What do you want? Nothing except you. There's the first profile of holiness from Thomas Aquinas. 